So on the conclusion of this part of the understanding of what saving faith is and what believe means and so on, we're looking at the basic topic, figures of speech referring to saving faith or faith in general, because you can say, I, I think you're right. That's a, a figure of speech saying, I believe what you're saying is true. Think of many ways you can explain that. You say, Amen. Somebody says something, you say, Amen. That's a statement of saying, I believe what you're saying. Thank you. Just the word thank you for telling me that. You've accepted what they said. Can you give me directions to so-and-so? Can I give you directions? Thank you. You believe the directions are right, and you go ahead and... and uh, and do what they say you should do in order to get to that destination. Take the so-and-so bus and so on. Okay, so the conclusions of these figures of speech. These pictures of faith all denote receptivity, agreement, or trust. All are essentially simple activities and essentially passive. None communicates the idea of merit, work, effort, or achievement. Neither do they communicate an exchange of one's life <coughs> or the ongoing submission of one's life to Jesus as master in order to obtain eternal life. That's with the view to eternal life. They just believe the information that is given to you in order to have eternal life. Now, the condition, the information, like in John 3.16, is God gave his one only son. Implication being, because of the context, payment for your sins. That's it. That's the only condition. Those are the facts that you are to believe or the maintaining uh, the information. That's what information you are to accept is true, and then you have eternal life. When we observe the clear statements in John about the condition for salvation, the effect of this condition, and the pictures of this condition, we conclude that John presents faith alone, and Christ alone is the only condition for salvation unto eternal life. unto eternal life, because you have the other, temple salvation, which requires something a little bit different. <clears throat> you believe that Jesus will rescue you. Well, you have to give him information about what you need to be rescued by sometimes. Uh, the condition that Christ died for your sins is going to give you the result of eternal life. The condition that God will hear your prayers uh, in certain circumstances, that's a different context. But the, the faith that he will save you after presenting the information of what you need to be saved from in this temporal life is in view. So it is extremely significant that we do not see qualifiers with the word believe. John does not need, need condition salvation unto eternal life. That's important qualification here, unto eternal life on whether one really believes or truly believes. If you believe something, it's real. It's true that what you believe, whether or not what you believe is going to get the re intended result, <clears throat> whether the information that you believe in is correct is another issue. But it's a true belief. It's an actual, real-life acknowledgement of something that is true. <clears throat> may not be true. Neither does he speak of genuine faith or real faith, or effectual faith. There's only one kind of faith. One that either believes in something, or he does not. Is that something accurate? The key here is, therefore, those who speak of spurious faith, or false faith, or psychologizing faith, as the scripture neither does nor provides a basis for doing. <clears throat> you get the gospel right. Should be easy. <coughs> <clears throat> dozens and dozens of places in the Bible tell you Jesus Christ died for your sins. Do you believe that? Yes, you have eternal life. So you have a belief, accepting something is true, and you have an accurate accounting for what you need to believe in order to get the intended result, eternal life. So in contrast, John does use qualifiers to distinguish the real from the fraudulent in other concepts. He speaks of the true light, true bread, true vine, true worshipers, and true God. When he shows that even the unsaved can be referred to as disciples, he later calls the saved to adhere to his word, disciples indeed. 
Neither do we find condition <clears throat> for salvation stated as surrender or commitment of all of one's life to Jesus as master. That's a lifelong thing, and it's, it's um, only momentarily at best by the grace of God because you're not going to be perfect in anything you think, say, and do in this mortal life. Salvation is totally and absolutely free and is not conditioned on human merit. It is what one receives, not earns, merits, or bargains for. What verse do you think that's good? Two verses. Acts, uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, saved without merit. And that salvation is not earned, is the gift. Gifts aren't earned. It's free. Gift of God, not by works, so you don't earn it or barter for it, lest anyone should boast. So, it will be given freely to whoever asks. And here is John 4.10, explaining that. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. So the issue is not the quality or quantity of an individual's faith, but to whom that faith is directed, which will produce eternal life. If it is directed toward Jesus Christ, you have eternal life. Now, salvation requires faith alone in Christ alone plus nothing. That's a key point here. Because you want to define what believe means in general, right? And now we get specific faith in a specific content which arrives at giving you the intended result of eternal life. You intended to get the result when you believe something. Salvation requires faith alone in Christ alone, plus nothing. So salvation is not conditioned upon continual obedience. And Pastor Bing goes on to say, similarly, we do not find salvation continued on or we will result in continual obedience. If anything, we can argue that John's gospel purposefully uh, introduces us to those who believed in Jesus as Savior, but were less than fully committed as disciples, or were partially obeying him. Martha believed and was obviously saved. 11.27 of John. Let's take a look at that. That's an amazing passage. Because it gives you a person. 11.27. A person whom Jesus knew very well. And Jesus is having a discussion with her. <coughs> Go back a little bit and check. The disciples then said to Jesus, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will dis Lazarus, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of Lazarus' death, but they thought that he was speaking of literal sleep. So Jesus then said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, so that you may believe but let us go to him. Therefore Thomas, who was called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, so that we may die with him. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Mar Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother's recent death. Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him. But Mary stayed at the house. <clears throat> Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask of him, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. She had some good insights here. She was listening to Jesus uh, preach. Jesus said to her, listen to this. Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives <clears throat> and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? He said to Martha. Wow. Jesus, she said to him, Martha said to Jesus, Yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. All these amazing titles, the Christ, the Son of God, he who comes into the world. We're looking at Jesus Christ's propitiation for the sins of the whole world. The Son of God, the Son of Man. And she knew this. When she had said this, she went away and called Mary, her sister, 
saying secretly, the teacher is here and is calling for you. So what was presented here for Martha to do, she already stipulated ahead of time. Believe. So, Martha believed and was obviously saved, John eleven twenty seven, which we just read. And we can assume Mary and Lazarus were too. But there is no indication that she followed Christ in the fullest sense of leaving home and family. She was there in the house. Less than full confession and commitment are also found in the secret disciple Joseph of Arimathea. Some would argue that Nicodemus was also in this category. In addition, the Jewish rulers mentioned in John 12:42. They believed in Christ, but did not confess him publicly for fear of being ostracized by the other Jewish rulers. Yet nothing in Scripture indicates that they were not truly saved, and John 1, 12-13 stipulates that anyone who believes is. Remember John 1, 12-13. John has a marvelous way about writing, and especially the Gospel. Keeps it direct and to the point using the same words so that you understand that you can't mess it up by turning one word against another, uh, taking an alternate meaning, and this is an additional step you have to take. It just gives you belief. But as many as received him, what is received means, that's an interesting word which we looked at, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. That last phrase there says, to receive him, you have to believe in his name. Who were, not, who were born then, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but born of God. So you believe, you receive. And that's it. Believe he died for your sins. Next point, faith. Unto eternal life does not need works added to it in order to become faith and affect the result of eternal life. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. <clears throat> For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this salvation is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. I, I wrote salvation in the, in the brackets there because this is neuter. Nu, tuto in the, in the Greek. Tuto is neuter. Faith is, is feminine. So the only thing that's left is the subject that we're talking about. Saved. Salvation. And that's neuter. Not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So, since salvation is by faith, and since salvation is not by works, it says, not by works. Let's see. Then faith cannot be of works, nor can works be permitted to validate faith in this way, in any way. Take a look at that. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. You need to correct this. <clears throat> Great verse to memorize. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one can, may boast. Not by works, so that no one can boast. Just as milk is milk, before anything is added to it, and adding something like chocolate to it merely changes it into chocolate plus milk, or chocolate milk, so faith does not need works added to it in order to become faith. It already is faith. Once works are added, then the faith becomes faith plus works. The works being an expression of that faith, as you move on in the Christian life, which already existed, the faith itself, existed in the first place to get you eternal life. That faith being all that was needed to result in eternal life. So, since salvation is by faith, and I must say alone, and since salvation is not by works, it is a gift. And not of your cell. Then faith cannot be of works. Nor can works be permitted to validate faith in any way. 
and it's 